my name is Kimia and I'm honored to host this session uh, and uh, introduce our distinguished lecturer, uh, Professor Carl Henrik Janssen. Professor Janssen received his PhD degree in automatic control at Lund University. He is a professor at the School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science in KTH Royal Institute of Technology. He is a fellow of IEEE and the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Science. His research is focused on networked and distributed control and estimation, cyber physical and cyber secure control systems, hybrid and embedded systems with applications in transportation, energy and automation networks. He has had several editorial activities. Currently, he's uh, the editorial board member of Annual Review of Control Robotics and, uh, Robotics and Autonomous Systems and of uh, European Journal of Control. Carl received several distinctions and awards, including IEEE Control System Society Distinguished Lecturer and Distinguished Professor of the Swedish Research Council. Around, 10 year, around two years ago, before the corona time, I had a chance to attend uh, his talk before uh, that time about uh, freight transport using automated truck platooning. And today in this lecture, uh, he's going to share with us a new founding in this area with uh, the four pillars of data modeling, control and optimization. So Professor, we're eager to hear more from you. Thank you. Thank you for that very kind uh, introduction. Uh, and thanks for, for having me. I'm uh, delighted to get this opportunity to speak in this, uh, in this summer school. Uh, I see it's been a very interesting uh, program you have. Let me ask before I start uh, my talk, I just ask you, does everything look and sound okay? Yes, yes, it's yes. good. Okay. Okay, yeah, so, so, so thanks. It, it's really a great uh, pleasure. You have had many, many talks um, during the week. Um, actually, just as, as uh, was mentioned here, I decided to, to do an application talk now as the last, um, for the last day here of the summer school. And you will see a little bit what I will focus on. Uh, some work we have been doing on this uh, automated truck platoons. Uh, one piece will be basically talking about how do we design a complex control system, which is maybe beyond a lot of what we are doing in our labs and so on, taking on a fairly big challenge and, and how do we design control for that. That would be the first uh, hour or the first lecture here. And then I will talk about something more recent namely how should we control traffic flow using truck platoons that was actually relate a little bit also to the next speaker professor antonella uh, ferrara but, but uh, before uh, I, I start i would like to say that particularly the first part of this uh, lecture it's something we have been working on in my group for uh, a long long time now <laughs> Uh, probably 10, 15 years or so. And there is a lot of students, PhD students and postdoc who have graduated from my group now are out in, in various, uh, uh, various jobs around the world. And, and they have, of course, done the, the work that I've been talking about. There is quite a number of students that, here who are still working in this area. And, and I will mention some of their, their work. So in general, why are we interested in uh, trucks? Um, I mean, the tra and, and this is one view of uh, seeing it. So as you know, transport contributes significantly to the CO2 emissions in the world. And in this plot here from the International Energy Agency, you see the distribution between different uh, uh, different modes of transportation and how their contribution to CO2 emissions vary over time. Now we are somewhere here, 2021, right? So you see that uh, the biggest part is passenger cars, but a significant part is also medium and heavy trucks. 
Then you have shipping, aviation, flights, and uh, airplanes, and, and, and so on. Um, but of course, when we, we talk about it, we, we maybe sometimes don't think about what can we actually do when it comes to making trucks more energy efficient. Uh, so there is a lot of things going on, uh, electrification, both with passenger cars, but also with trucks battery technology and other technology is moving pretty quickly. So there is research going on on this for, for trucks as well. But also automation plays a very important role. So if we should achieve what the agency here predicts for the future, namely that all these, all these modes, transport modes, the CO2 emission should go down, uh, we need to, to use this type of new technology. And I will particularly talk about automation, right? I'm a control engineer. And this is an interesting plot illustrating a little bit uh, the predictions here that has been made about the impact of vehicle automation on the energy consumption in this, this area. And it's quite interesting, you see on the x-axis here, there is now uh, an estimate of how would this uh, particular component of automation influence energy consumptions. So you see that the, the bars to the left here indicates that there will, could be a reduced amount of energy consumed. But interesting enough is that we, we don't know, know for sure. For instance, if we come up with much better uh, automated ways of using our uh, vehicles, maybe the cost will go down. And if the cost goes down for transport, maybe we will we will travel much more or we'll send much more goods over the infrastructure here. Um, in this talk, I will, will talk about that the platooning and how that can contribute. Um, it relates to something called eco driving, how you more economically can can regulate the velocity and other things in the vehicle. I will also in the second part here now talk about how we can use this technology to mitigate congestion. So I'm focusing uh, what seems to be a positive side of, of, of this. So before we start, let me show just an illustration uh, illustrating what the technology we have been developing here. So let's say that we are in Germany we have two transport missions going between uh, four cities. If these uh, trucks now traveling between the cities are sharing, as you see here, sharing a piece of the road together, they can go uh, and travel in a road train or a platoon. If we had information about all the sources and destination of these transport missions around Europe, we could coordinate that. The actual system that we developed looks like this. So here you see three uh, trucks going in a platoon. We regulate automatically the distance between the trucks so they stay close together. That is happening by communicating information wirelessly between the vehicles. And then you automatically control the velocity, braking, and, and so on. Here, as you see in the experiments, the, there are drivers in the driver's seat, but they are actually not doing uh, much in this experiment. But of course, it's not just about going in a truck platoon. Here, of course, we need also to form truck platoons on the highway. So in this case, you saw the last truck here joined a platoon of two vehicles and formed a larger uh, platoon. There will obviously be other traffic on the on the highway here. So it could be like that uh, white uh, car that's tried to sneak into the platoon and then the platoon automatically needs to actually open up like you saw here so, so that it gives space to that. If the car now leaves, then the platoon again needs to, to shrink the distance between the vehicles. So there is automation also on that, on that level. And if something here, this is an automated system, if there is something running out in front of the first vehicle or something happening, of course, if that breaks now, perhaps automatically because of some radar or so, all the other vehicles here need also to be, be braking. So that is kind of the system. So you get an idea about the system that we, 
we are talking about and what we mean by a, a track platoon in, in, in this case. So what we will do over these uh, next two hours here is, as I said, the first hour would, would really answer that question. How can we design a system around this track platooning? So uh, I will talk about the track platooning on the low level kind of what is, was happening there in these experiments, but I was also put it into a larger transport system. And you will see what I mean by, by that to illustrate how we design control and optimization systems of some layered uh, scale. And then the second hour would be quite different. There I would, instead of trying to now optimize the system so that the, it's as fuel efficient or as automated as possible as in the first lecture. In the second, I will ask, can I now use these automated track platoon to do something good for the rest of the road traffic? So can I control the rest of the road traffic, which might not be automated for, for many, many years with a few of these automated track platoons? So these are, are what we will be, be speaking about here. And of course, I'm more than happy if, if you have some questions or, or please interrupt at any point. Uh, after some time when you sit here in front of your screen speaking, you, you, you wonder if there is someone out there or, or not. So uh, feel free to interrupt and ask questions at, at any point. So let's start with the first, uh, first part. So the problem here, that the starting point, we can formulate um, uh, quite, uh, so to say, on an abstract and simple way. We can say that, you know, in society, and society in this talk here happens to be Germany, as you see in the picture, we, we ask, how can we efficiently transport goods between uh, the cities in the highway network? In society today, anywhere in the world, Basically, you have goods being transported between uh, cities because cities is where people live. That's where you have factories and, 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 and so on, right? So there is a lot, a lot of transport happening over the highways in, 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 that, in, in that way. So what can we say about that system? If we think about this now as a large system. Yeah, how large is it? So in the European Union, there is about 2 million uh, of these type of, of trucks. So, so they are called uh, heavy long haulage trucks. So that means not the truck that you that do deliver uh, within a city or so. That's not what we're talking about. We are talking about the trucks that go from uh, Lausanne to Stockholm or something like that. So they are long haulage. So, so you see the size now. So a couple of million are, are traveling across Europe. Uh, so, so it's a quite large system, but it's not enormously large. So we can think about how, how that can be coordinated. What is interesting from a scientific viewpoint in particular for us as control engineers is that it's actually very little control today or real-time coordination between vehicles and, and the, the uh, fleet operation. On the low level, if we look at an inv individual vehicle, that is very high tech today. You have computational capabilities comparing to a high-end PC on board and you have have tons of sensors and communication capabilities and so on. But in between this system, it's rather low tech, uh, I, I would say. An interesting perspective from a viewpoint of um, uh, operators here is that in this system, there is a lot of small operators, meaning not, not UPS or FedEx, uh, but those who maybe just have a one, two, three, four, five trucks. And uh, for them, it, now it's very interesting if one can improve their ability to run this system uh, by using technology and more communication. So what is the problem I, I want to say it solves? So this is a summer school on optimization and control. So let's try to formulate it as an optimization control problem. So I basically have this, this system I'm considering. I would like to maximize now automation and I would like to maximize fuel savings for this system. 
I still want to drive around here over the net over the road network and delivering goods, right? So I don't want to change the speed or route or timing very much because this is, let's say, built in on the operation. But I would like to, so with new technology, improve the, the cooperation here that we do by using this track platooning. And why do we focus on the fuel, on the energy, and on the automation? We can, we can think about it from a societal viewpoint, but if you are a, a, a track owner or you work in an automotive, in the automotive industry, this pie chart is very important. So this is a life cycle cost of a, a, a track for the owner now of that track. And you see that there is two big uh, pieces here. So fuel, the fuel cost is about one third of the cost of this system. And the salary cost of the driver is another third. This is for a track. Of course, if you look at a, at a car, uh, I mean, you wouldn't spend 35% of the cost on, on fuel because a car is not running that, that much typically as a track. So these are systems that are running 24 uh, seven here. So you see, obviously, if we can automate the system and if we can make it more fuel efficient, it would be great for this, for, for, for the owner here or, or for the... So this is a reason why we see that all track manufacturing in the world is taking up this type of, of technology. So what, what is the system now when I talk about the freight transport system? What, what do I have in mind? So I have a vision here which says that in the future, you will see something like in my cartoon here. So we will have then platooning vehicles, platooning trucks on the highways around. These platoons, this road train needs to form automatically. They go between cities, between a factory and a hub and so on, supported by the type of technology, communication technology and so on, computing technology that we, we have around. If we should think about now solving that problem that I just stated, how, how would you go about it? So from, from what we know from control is that typically when we have this type of complex control problems, we layer them up. So we built a layer system where we try to separate concern into different layers, different level here in this architecture. And this is what we also have proposed for this system. So you see, if we do bottom up here, you see on the lowest level here, that's where we do vehicle control. That's where we um, regulate the distance between the trucks. But that's only, so to say, in stationarity, a capability that is not enough for the whole system, right? So when we know that we can do that, then on one level up, we have what we call a platoon manager. That's the one that makes sure that we actually can form and, and split up platoons while we are driving on the highway and that this happen automatically, like you saw in the video previously. So how, how should that happen? How do you now automatically do this thing? Um, further up, of course, every truck is not coming from the same uh, city or plant and going to the same destination. So, and they're not doing that at the same time. So therefore there is some coordination on the third level here where you try now to maximize basically that trucks meet each other. So you see, it, it seems like a scheduling problem and I will come back to that and show that it is a scheduling problem. One can formulate it as a mixed integer optimization problem and try to schedule uh, this so that automatically without the influence of the driver, it just happens so that maybe two tracks here meet more or less at this point and then start platooning. And then on the top level, you have the connection now to the fleet management system, to the logistic system that the operators are, are, are using. That's another, so to say, piece here. So this integration into an overall um, a freight transport system, as I said, is something we proposed a few years back in, in this paper, and we are, are, have been working on making contributions on different levels. 
We are part now on a fairly big EU project, been going on uh, for a few years, where all the European truck brands are involved, basically implementing in practice this architecture that we have been proposing and focusing in that project on the multi-brand aspects. You don't just want that a Mercedes platoon with a Mercedes or a Scania with a Scania truck, but you want them to, to, to be able to platoon with each other because typical fleet owners, of course, they have different type of, of trucks. Let's come a little bit more into detail now, and I will start bottom up and describe. Uh, there is part a of this. question in the chat. Yes, please. Uh, uh, maybe I can give it. Uh, sorry for the naive question because I don't have background in uh, transportation, etc. But what exactly are the advantages of forming a platoon? Perhaps you mentioned it, but. Uh, yeah, the, the, that's an, an excellent question. So why do we go in a platoon at all? So if you allow, actually, the next couple of slides will we'll answer exactly that question. But basically, mm -hmm. the, the, the main one, as you will see, is that you, uh, you reduce the air drag uh, going together. Another one is that by automating the driving, the driver can do something else. Or it can even be so that the driver doesn't have to, to sit in the driver's seat at all. So it's, it's an efficiency on, on, that, on, on these two aspects. But, but that is exactly what the, I would like to, to, to I, I, will, I will illustrate a little bit that uh, coming up next when we start talking about the low, low level platoon. So thank you very much for that, that question. Are there any other uh, questions? I don't see, while I'm speaking here, I don't see the chat. So, so please, if someone just, if you just do like you did now, interrupt and so. Any other questions or comments? Okay, otherwise I, I go a little bit into the details now. So control of vehicle platoons have been around for, for quite some time. Uh, this is a paper more than 50 years, um, uh, old here uh, from MIT, where they where they proposed actually the, the um, that one can think about controlling vehicles in a platoon by thinking about it as connected masses, as you see. There was a huge success in in uh, California in the 80s and 90s, and an enormous project where they think about how can we automate a highway, and they they developed architectures for this where you integrate both the highway together with the vehicle. And there were a, a, a successful demo in, in the late 90s, the one you see here to the left. Then not much happened in the industry, I would say, for quite some time. Um, but over maybe the last 10 years or so, there have been much more work coming bottom up, I would say, not automating the highway completely, but thinking about how can we automate vehicles more and more. And in, in Sweden, we are lucky to have two big truck manufacturers called the Scania and Volvo. And they have both been involved with, with us working on this type of, of technology. So now back to that nice question, so why? And, and the why here is physics. So the, here you see the, the air uh, uh, pressure on a truck. You see that two trucks here in a platoon the, the color here, the dark color means high air pressure. When we move the second track here closer to the first track, you see that that air pressure is reduced. A reduced air pressure means an increased air drag re uh, reduction. So here you see now on the X axis, the relative distance in the platoon and on the Y axis, the air drag reduction. So you see now that the second and third track in this three track platoon get an air drag reduction of 40 to 50% here. So you get an air drag reduction, which is huge by going now close together. How close? You have to be 10, 20 meter um, in order to get this air drag reduction. Even the first track get an air drag reduction if other tracks is so close uh, to it uh, behind. So such big air drag reduction mean a significant fuel reduction. So typically it could be something like 10%, but 
but in different experiments and, and, and different condition, it can be larger or, or smaller. But imagine that you have a system running 24 seven, consuming uh, diesel here uh, and, and polluting the, the, the world with CO2. And you can reduce the consumption of fuel here by several percent. It, it's, it's enormous uh, um, possibility. So this is, I would say, the key reason why there is such a big interest in this type of, of technology. But notice here then why this is interesting from a control and communication viewpoint that we want to drive the vehicles 10, 20 meters behind each other. So if you're a driver here, you cannot manually do that. So you need automation. And what does that automation look like? So, so inside a truck, inside a single truck, it looks like this. You have a, a communication bus, which communicates information from the sensors that you see here to the left into the cruise controllers. The cruise controller computes now the reference velocity, braking, and the gear for, for the activation. So if you have an own car, you maybe have a cruise controller in, in that. So this, this is just the same idea here, right? You, you switch on the cruise controller. But notice now that if we go in a platoon, this is just another type of cruise controller. I draw it as a block inside here and I call it collaborative adaptive cruise controller, CACC. So from an implementation viewpoint, this platooning I'm talking about here is mainly pieces of code. It's mainly control theory if you want. So we assume that the vehicle can communicate between each other which in many cases they can already today or they will have increased capability in the future. So they control, communicate with each other. Then someone decide to switch on the CACC and then that enables automatic platooning between the vehicles. So that is basically on a high level how it works. Now let's go into some control theory here. So, how, can, how should we now control that important spacing between the vehicle, which we would like to uh, do, uh, keep small, right? And since we don't know the size of the platoon, and also it can be quite far from, from, the, from one vehicle to the, from the last vehicle to the first, we cannot assume that everyone can communicate to everyone else. Instead, it's, uh, we would like to have a distributed control architecture. And this problem now, if we try to distributely control this, it can create some issues here. And this has been studied in the control literature by many. And, and the concept here is, is string stability. So the system can become a string unstable, like you see in this plot here. There is a disturbance in the first vehicle and that propagates downstream in the platoon. So the last vehicle in this case have a much higher disturbance. So there is nothing else here more than that the string of vehicle is actually in, uh, increasing the, the, the oscillation in the system. So this has been studied a lot in the, in the literature. I will take the viewpoint on um, some discovery we made here and illustrate it first by some experiments we did some years back. So now we are out on the highway west of Stockholm where you see three vehicles going in a platoon. So let me take a, a, a control system now of that type you saw, a distributed controller. So vehicle one regulates the, the um, uh, uh, vehicle one controller regulates vehicle one, vehicle two controller, uh, vehicle two, etc. And they communicate with each other in the way you see there. So let's look at a few kilometer of that road I just indicate. The top plot here shows the altitude of that road. So the hill is going up, down, up, down, up here. Um, what is happening now with the first two vehicles? The blue, uh, uh, the blue line here is the first vehicle. And you see in the second plot there, you see how the velocity of, this, of the first vehicle go up in the down hill, and then it varies a little bit around. So this seems to be fairly natural, right? While if we look at the second vehicle, the red line here, 
it first looks nice. It follows the first vehicle as it's supposed to. And then strange things happen. So it starts to oscillate when we are going downhill. And the second time we are going downhill, it oscillates quite heavily. It oscillates uh, in velocity, which means that it will oscillate in the distance between the vehicle. And it, it means also that the torque is varying. And even the second vehicle has to brake a few times. So it seems to be pretty bad. It's, it's probably quite scary to sit in the second vehicle there while it's oscillating its distance towards the first, the first vehicle. So, what, uh, so when we saw this, we asked first, of course, that could this just be a matter of tuning the control or is it a bad tune? tune? But we realized that there was something else going on here and that there was some fundamental scientific problem. Um, so we asked basically, how can we handle topography variations here? How, sh how should we handle them in the, in the system? So we didn't really use any information of the road grade in the experiments, but also how should we regulate the distance between the vehicle? And this is what I'm going to, to talk about uh, next here. And let me illustrate the, the basic ideas by a cartoon. So you see how we come up with this way of doing the, the, the control as we did. So let's say that we look first at the single vehicle this vehicle travels with a constant velocity and then at the point here comes to an uphill. We will never know exactly where that uphill is. So this means that the velocity, if we plot the velocity over time, there will be a little disturbance, a little dip in the velocity exactly at that, at that point when the uphill starts. This dip, we can now plot, the velocity we can plot over time like we do to the left, or we can plot over space, so along the road. That's the same, right? If we now put a platoon together and we try to regulate the distance between the vehicles, let's say that we regulate the distance between the vehicles perfectly. So we have very good controllers. They regulate on a distance D here. What will then happen when this first vehicle get this disturbance? In time then, all the vehicles, since they are perfect regulation, they will see the same velocity uh, bump instantaneously. If we plot it in space instead, they will experience this at different point in space, namely where they are here in my cartoon. So, so this means, as you can think about, if you propagate now this uh, PowerPoint picture forward in time, the second vehicle will also experience that velocity bump a little bit later. And then the third vehicle, we do it uh, twice more, etc. So you see, there are some issues with if we try just to regulate constant uh, spacing. If we instead regulate the headway, we get something different as if we regulate time gap. So if we say that we should keep a fixed time gap between the vehicle, and then we regulate how big that time gap is, we can actually get exactly the opposite picture to the first one you saw. Namely, it can be so that we can, can, can get a situation like you see down to the right there. So what, what is all this about? What, why, why is this interesting? Yeah, so if we, if we think about it a little bit further, it's easy to see that if we now have a constant time gap here that we regulate, that corresponds to that each vehicle should have the same velocity at the same point in space S here. So what consequence does that have? It means that the overall control objective of regulating the distances in the platoon are breaking up into two control objectives. One saying that each vehicle, I here, should have the same reference when it's at the same space in time. And then we should regulate the, the time gap between the vehicle. So basically, the overall control problem is breaking up into two control uh, uh, objectives. So you see, we have basically reason about something uh, that says that we should have a cascade control loop here. That seems to be a suitable thing, thing to do. So this was a proof by, by, uh, 
uh, some, some uh, pictures, right? So what about theory supporting this? So let me show a little bit what theory one can develop here. So I mentioned this concept of string stability. So if we now have that type of disturbance that I illustrate here coming from the environment, we introduce a concept we call disturbance string stability. So we have a string of vehicles which are autonomous and connected in this, in this way. As you see here, so we have capital N number of vehicles in, connected in a string. Disturbance string stability is just an input output stability concept now. Uh, so if you're familiar with that type of, of theory, uh, bounded input, bounded output, you, you recognize yourself. So I basically say here that uh, uh, the system is disturbance string stability if I can bound, upper bound the state of every vehicle with some quantity that you see here to, to the right. Something that depends on initial conditions, something that depends on the, on the disturbances. So uh, the platoon is disturbance string stable if the state somehow is experienced something like you see in the plot down there. And the nice thing now is that this concept, which is a global concept, right? All the vehicles should fulfill uh, this. This can actually be moved into a local check because if it is so that every vehicle can be bounded by its own quantities and the vehicle that it has ahead. So if that can be bounded in this way, then the overall platoon will be a disturbance string stable. So then all the vehicles, we know that, that they will not experience this type of instability. So it helps us to put a local condition that we can use for control design, designing local or distributed controller and still guaranteeing global stability in our global performance. So how can we translate that theorem into something useful? So let me show you one thing that we did here. So you, we can, for instance, form an error now, which corresponds to both the velocity error that we have here. So the, 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 um, the second, uh, the, the tracking this, this reference here, right? And we can add also then the, the um, error that we have in the, uh, in the distance between the, the vehicle uh, there. So we can form an, an error and then we can look at that error and regulate that. And this is basically what it says here. So if I regulate on this error now, it's enough that every vehicle keeps that error small, then we guarantee uh, the overall stability of the system. So let's jump back to our experiment and see what is different now. What, what have I through that uh, work done? So number one, I have introduced road grade information. I say that the, uh, we need to have that information. So I have introduced here, I said I have a database of the road grade and I use that. I use that in a block, which I call a platoon coordinator. The platoon coordinator here now computes velocities V star. And as you saw from previously, all the velocities here in the platoon should be the same when we look at in space. So you communicate that information to all the vehicles simultaneously. That means that when we now do this, uh, this experiment here, you see that when we plot velocity over space for all vehicles, they will uh, be or should be the same. In these simulations here, they are almost perfect as you can, you can see. So this is how we now perform this, this uh, local uh, control. Let me, I, I see that this took a little bit longer time when I was uh, expected. So maybe uh, you give me just, uh, uh, or should we, maybe we can take a break uh, here so I don't run too, too, too late. W would, that be, would that be fine? Yes, yes, we can take a really short break. Uh, so how long break uh, do you usually take? I'm uh, flexible. Uh, if, yeah, if you still have uh, quite a few materials, I think we can take a five minutes or six minutes break and we come back at 20. 
That sounds great. So let's go for a coffee and then we start at 20 past nine again. Yes. And, uh, and then when we can start also with some questions. I forgot to ask that now, but, but when you're back, we, we can take some questions on the first part here. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks. Mentioned Kimia that we met. Uh, where, where did we? Uh... It was in uh, ETH, I think, maybe oh, around two this... and a half years ago. There was some uh, 
and then there was like a course in the control group that they were uh, every time um, writing some lecture around the, the Europe. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. I remember it was it was a, a course by Professor Brad Nelson, uh, right? It, yeah, I guess. It was very nice uh, seminar uh, series. Uh, uh, it was a big, uh, yeah, sorry, then then you actually, I think uh, some of this uh, may be overlap. You, you, you can, uh, the next hour will be new. <laughs> no, no, actually, that's really good. I really I, enjoy uh, this talk. Yeah, so yeah. That's really like an interesting talk for me. So I always enjoy to hear it again. Yeah, thank you. Actually, I have a question. So I mean, we're talking a lot about uh, increasing um, the performance, but uh, what about the safety? So uh, is there like any guarantee that uh, with this platooning, we can uh, gain the safety even in the case that, I don't know, like the trucks need to, breakdown with the maximum deceleration yeah yeah safety is is uh, extremely important and and so to say it's 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 ba you, you can never propose something which so to say reduce the safety here so yeah. i i didn't show it here but but what we have been doing is that type both so to say experiments but we also have a lot of work on this area it's it's another set of 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 work there, which is is based on reachability. You, you try to estimate, so to say, where your your safety regions yeah. are and so on. Um, notice here, this is a, a very interesting research question. Uh, so is that, you know, is it safer to have a human sitting in this vehicle or to have it automated? And of course, if you ask the driver, they think they have more capability experience and so on. But in many cases, depending on uh, you know, what technology we're talking about, automation actually helps to improve safety. True. But it's not always so easy to, to prove that. And of course, there come some outliers also where there can be some severe things happening, which you said if, if there would be an experienced driver, you would avoid that. But we had actually, a, discussion uh, yesterday on, on this. We are working on a new project now, which is more doing advanced automated collision avoidance uh, under bad weather conditions for these trucks. Okay. You so, know, I, I'm sure also in Switzerland, this happens that when there are heavy snow or something like that, you know, these big 60 ton trucks can be quite dangerous. Yeah. yeah. And you, can you automate that? And so, yeah, so that's, that's a very good, uh, good comment. Yeah. But I had a feeling that, uh, I don't know, I was like, uh, before I was looking to some uh, other models for uh, like car following of the vehicles, like there is, for example, the IDEA model. And then there, uh, the relative distance between the vehicles are, I have the feeling that they're a little bit should be like uh, more than what is considered here. But okay, here we consider that, okay, so the trucks probably are moving with the same speed. So then the relative speed is zero. So we don't need to consider that. And then the other thing is the time gap that we need for the reaction time of, uh, okay, now we consider we don't have the driver. So maybe we can then turn it to some, uh, okay, the, I don't know, the delay in communication or something like this. And, um, so maybe some, yeah, these are maybe the parameters or the criteria that you considered for defining the relative distance between the cars within a platoon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what I showed here, I mean, actually in, in, in the academic literature, there is a lot of distance control uh, yeah. and some very simplistic one. I mean, what I showed here now with the time gap, that is actually what is being used in practice. I consider time gap or a variation of this because it's very natural to think about that you want to safety is about how much time do you have till yeah. you know, something could happen maybe maybe should i should i start again or, or yeah uh, of course sure okay <laughs> thanks for for the discussions and and for everybody else out there uh, please also interrupt and, and ask questions and so on. Maybe as I said before the break, 
maybe we can. Uh, is there any any other questions on the first piece when I talked about uh, platoon control? Yes, actually, I have a short question. Uh, it seems that uh, I, my question is that is it possible to directly just uh, generate a role profile uh, mapping between the role profile to the uh, whether uh, reference velocity because in that case you can fully decentralize the control if you just if you know that the angle of the road yeah. is like this then you change the reference that, that, that's that's a great observation and the answer unfortunately is no because what what you what you notice here there is two conflicting uh two conflicting objectives here right so you have each track have its optimal velocity if it was just riding on its own um, and but now when it's going in a platoon, it has uh, the conflict and objective of staying close to the other vehicles. And now, depending if if the vehicles were identical, then it would probably be so that they should now keep the same velocity, and then they could perfectly go in this platoon. But imagine just like one vehicle is is uh, two ton or five ton, the other one is sixty ton. One has a strong engine, the other one not a strong engine. Then, of course, you have to accept that the the distance here varies a little bit when you are going when you travel. So that is a more complex control problem than I talked about. If you're interested in that, please let me know. We we had a number of um, of, of paper actually on that because it's an interesting way problem. Also thinking, what should the order be in a platoon? And, and, uh, and so this is exactly what you touch upon. So that there is a need for communicating information in the platoon for this, for this uh, reason. And uh, I, I didn't show the equations here, but if you go on a flat road, it's easy to show in general that the best thing one can do is to keep a constant velocity. One shouldn't change the velocity if you don't have to. Uh, you, you, you can, uh, that could be a homework here to, to, to prove that with some uh, Newton uh, equations and, and so on. Thank, thanks for that. Uh, Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, otherwise we move up a little bit now. So we, now we talked about controlling a single platoon. Now, how do we form platoon? So forming a platoon, uh, I just mean something very simple, right? You come from different uh, sources here, you merge, and then you travel on the highway together for some time, and then you split. So we have a control problem like here. There are a one vehicle platoon coming from one distance, three uh, vehicle platoon coming somewhere else, and then they, they, they go together. The idea there is very similar to, uh, so the actual control is very similar to what you just saw. Uh, in, the, in the single vehicle. So we basically produce here optimal speed profile for the merger. So we form a control problem where you get information now about the vehicles and the formation controller generate these ve reference velocities to the tracks. Uh, of course there, this situation, if it would work or not to form the platoon depends on the traffic. So there is also traffic information that is needed here. So let's look into that a little bit from some experiments, what I mean, or how, how the traffic comes into play. So here we are running experiments, merging uh, a platoon. So we are sitting in the second vehicle, second track, and we are supposed now to merge with the track before and form a platoon. We do this 600 times, uh, we are outside Stockholm uh, in November, um, a few years back. So it's a, it's a very big type of experiments that we did. We did a different time of the year, different time of the day. So there is different amount of traffic around. The nice thing on the highway around Stockholm is that we have this, as you see down to the left here, we have these sensors. So these sensors measures the traffic flow and density in each lane. So in real time, we can have information about the traffic. And this is uh, the whole experimental campaign summarized into the traffic conditions that we have. So on the x-axis here, I have traffic density. So low traffic density, high traffic density. And then we have traffic flow here, so the velocity. And you see that 
if the traffic density is not so high, then there is a linear relationship here uh, that, that, that uh, is, is, is natural. If the density goes up, so it's heavy traffic, then we are all over here. So it's very hard when we have high density to build a model for traffic. If the density is small, it's easier to, to, to do that. This diagram, you will see more about uh, now, um, also more abstract version of that. This in traffic theory, this is uh, something which is fundamental. So I guess that's why they call it the fundamental diagram of traffic, uh, of, of traffic flow. But given this information now, we can formulate a platoon formation optimization problem. So the problem is we have two vehicles here. They are supposed to platoon together. So they should now find good velocities each other so that they can merge at some point, form a platoon until they then split again. And this we can now form as an optimal control uh, problem. In words, it would look like this. So we should now minimize the fuel consumption uh, that these uh, vehicles have, the trucks have, under the uh, constraints given by the vehicle dynamics, but also the traffic. So this might seem like a simple problem, but notice here that even if we can write out the Newton mechanics for the vehicle dynamics of the truck, what should we do about the traffic dynamics? So there we go down, we go back to classical traffic theory there. So in the 50s, there were three, three guys, Lighthill, Whitham and Richards, that were thinking about traffic flow and, and thought about that like fluid dynamics. So they say that we can represent traffic flow as a partial differential equation like this, where rho is the density of the traffic, x is the position along the road, tau is time, q is a function which is called the flux function. So this, we think about that this is representing all the, the cars, all the blue things in that plot up there. Then we, we can do what Daganso did in the 80s and 90s. You can discretize this PDE in time and space. So you get different segments here, and then you get a difference equation or discrete time equations as the one you see here to the left. So you have density in each cell is propagating depending on the flow into that cell or, or, or not. So with that type of model, you can now formulate the optimal control problem. You, the, the energy is basically proportional to, to the velocity cube here. So you formulate it as a, an optimal control problem with an open end time. And then you can, you can solve that using some numerical uh, techniques. So let's see what such solution uh, look like here. So, uh, so this diagram I'm showing here, I will, I will be back to this type of diagram many times. So let's let take some time so that we all understand it. So on the X axis, we have space here, 0, 20, 40, 60 kilometer. On the y-axis, we have time. So one hour, two hour, et cetera. So a straight line in this plot, like the black dashed line here, that's a truck that goes with constant velocity. Constant velocity in this space-time diagram is just a straight line. If we now take two trucks, like in this, in this case, V1, V2 there, at time point six here, one track starts at zero, another track starts at 40. So you see it's like in the, in the picture up there, they start at a different position and then they have different velocity. And with different velocity, they will then, the first track go a little bit slower. So the second catch up and then they meet at the point over there. Nothing uh, strange, right? And then they continue going with constant velocity uh, fr from there. Now we look at the color coding in this diagram. And the color coding is the traffic density. So dark blue is low traffic density, yellow is high traffic density. 
So you see that over space and time, there is different traffic density. And in many cases, traffic density, so to say, the high traffic density moves in this diagram in, 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 in space. Yes, like you were exper experienced when you were riding. If we now say that there, there is this traffic behind in this uh, diagram, these tracks that are going in constant velocity, they will actually not come and meet at that black uh, point there. They will meet at the red, where the red arrow is pointing. Why? Because they will be slowed down by the traffic, by the road traffic, just as you saw in my videos there. So they will be slowed down and meet a little bit later. Not only that, you see behind the red lines here, you see that there is a light yellow. So behind the tracks, uh, the, ro the, the road traffic, the cars are blocked a little bit partially. So there is a higher density building up just like you were expecting. So that building up is something very important for the rest of we, what we will talk about here. And what you can think that what is happening is that the tracks here is creating something we can call the bottleneck or actually a moving bottleneck. Why? Because if you see around this track V1 here, basically there is only two lanes left for cars. The track is going slower than the cars, so the cars have to take over there. So there becomes only two lanes there while there are three lanes over here. So there is like a moving bottleneck here. So the tracks are implicitly, you can say, regulating the car traffic. And the car traffic is, is uh, hindering a little bit the track, particularly the second track here to, to, to form the, the platoon. If we solve the problem I had on the previous slide, the optimal, the fuel optimal merge point would be even a little bit later and you should follow this dashed uh, green light. So this is how the automatic merger of the platoon that we developed is, is, uh, is working uh, there. Uh, and this uh, improves the fuel savings and, and so on by, by, by doing that. Uh, yeah, this is, this is just a parenthesis here. While doing all the experiments, something interesting happens. Sometimes there is a little uh, red car there. You see, we sit in the second track. We are supposed to merge with the track ahead of us. We cannot merge because that, that red car is not moving. And you see the same thing in the, in the picture down here that the yellow car here block ourselves. So this, this led us to start thinking a little bit about the human here, the human driver, or if you want to use the term cyber-physical human system, you can say this is clearly a system where human decisions play, play a role. And that, that's a little bit a separate track of research, but it's something that we have been, been working on, um, on uh, recently. We can then, we can move up in the hierarchy. I talk now about the, the platoon control. I talk about the platoon merger here. Uh, I was supposed to talk then about the platoon coordination and so, but I, I, I realized with time here that I won't have time to that. But, but you know, we, we also worked on this optimization problem that um, basically who should platoon with whom? How should we coordinate individual vehicles so that they meet and then, uh, so to say, so that you optimize the amount of platooning that is happening and, and so on. If you're interested in that, I would be more than happy to, to talk more about that. Instead, what I would like to talk now about is the second part. How can we use track platoons to control traffic? And that is a direct, you can see it as a direct consequence of what I just show you when we were doing this merger. So the idea is the following now. You have these track platoons all over the highway, as you see here to the left. We, we, we are driving them automatically like this. What we also know is that in human driven traffic, so with car traffic, like you see here to the right, you get different type of phenomena happening, like a stop and go wave, the one you see there. It's sometimes called a phantom waves as well. That is building up because drivers tend to, 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 to react uh, in a way which, which creates them. The question is now, can we use 
the track platoon here now to avoid this phenomena happening or reduce the amount of of such such things and you see now from what i just described in the in the track merger that i said that a single track or a track platoon is reducing the ability for cars to move here in along the road so this means that actually we can use it to regulate and influence the car traffic so this is actually something if you if you like uh, a historical remark and uh, that one can say that traditional traffic control is using what Euler was thinking about when he introduced, uh, um, so to say, the theory of, of fluid dynamics and so on. Because traditionally, you have actually stationary observers and stationary uh, actuation in traffic. So you have this road sign observing, uh, sorry, you have these measurement devices observing the, the state, and then you are controlling it perhaps with digital road signs. Lagrange, as you might know, consider instead particles moving in the flow and describe the dynamics from that viewpoint. Particles here are vehicles. So we can think now instead of doing Lagrangian traffic control, where we get observations from individual vehicles, and we are using individual vehicles also for control. So what I'm going to spend the last 20 minutes here on is describing the control system down to the right here. So where we use individual track platoons, or it can also be other vehicles, in order to gather information to the control system, and then we implement the control actions by regulating the speed of these platoons. And let's start with one particular uh, situation so you, you, you see how it works. So let's say that we have a track platoon over here to the left. We have traffic jam, so high density uh, over here to the, to the right. So now we can basically move the, 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 the track in this um, and see how it influences the development of the, of the traffic density. So now we are back to the same type of diagram as you, as you saw previously. Uh, in this diagram, we now look at one track platoon. It's this red uh, platoon, uh, red line. So you see, we go with constant velocity. It goes a little bit slower than the, road, than the car traffic. Then we come to a yellow area here. It's a high density area. So the track is going slower through that, and then it continues. So this yellow area represents, you can think about it as a car accident. There was a car accident at 50 kilometer and a time zero here. And then th that car accident means that it become congesti congestion. And the congestion is then this yellow area, which as you have experienced, propagate forward in time, of course, in this diagram, but backward in space. It's very com common, right? And then after some time, this is dissolved, and then it's fine with the traffic again. So this is just a situation that happens uh, every day in, on a highway. OK, so now what can we do? So we can control now this uh, platoon um, uh, here. So what did I do to the right? I now computed what velocity should I keep the track platoon in order to actually come to this point exactly where the, uh, where the uh, traffic jam has been dissolved? Of course, that computation is not trivial, right? I need to propagate a model forward a time of traffic, and I need to propagate this uh, information about the high density there in order to find out that point that I would like the, the track platoon to go through. But you see a consequence of the implementation of that controller is that uh, the, the uh, track platoon would not experience a traffic jam. It goes a little bit slower uh, than, than to the left, as you see. It generates a little bit, block a little bit of traffic, but not as all as severe as, as in the traffic jam over there to the right. So it seems to be doing something good there. 
So let's reason about how, how good it is, or is it so that it slows down the rest of the traffic? Again, a similar scenario, uh, same strategy. We have a yellow, we have a congested area to the right. We apply this type, or sorry, we, we don't apply this type of control I just talked about. In this case, due to the traffic jam over here, we can compute what is the total travel time for all the vehicles that we have, for all the cars. If there would be no congestion, uh, we have some travel time. When we now have this congestion, it will become an increase of 38% of the total travel time over, over this. So a significant delay of all the traffic that we have. If we now apply the control I just described, the increase in total travel time due to this congestion is only 8%. So you see that with this type of controller, what we have, have shown here now is that we can not only make it better for the platooning tracks, but it's actually better for everybody. There is a social good here with that type of control. But that, that was more like an illustration. Let's go under the hood now. What is this control system I'm talking about? And uh, now I will come to very recent work. Uh, most of this is based on a PhD thesis by Mladen Sisic that was defended uh, last winter. So this is the same picture as you saw uh, previously. So I said that we have some connected and automated vehicle. This vehicle can send measurements up into, into a control uh, system. And then this control system based on state information make a decision about how the vehicle should be controlled. Uh, the underlying model that we have for the road traffic is uh, that type of classical model, the LWR model from the 50s I mentioned, I put it down to the right here, so you, just for you to remember, right? So the individual cars here are represented by a density, uh, density that is evolving over time. In what I showed previously, I actually assumed that I had, uh, that I had state information. So here, uh, if we come back here, I assume to the right that I know the state of the system. So I know the color if you want. The same thing when we had here. I assume with the platoon controller that I know the, the, the density. Of course, no one is going to know the density perfectly here, not even with that type of measurements devices that we had here in the highway in, in, in Stockholm. Instead, what you, you need to do is that you, you need to estimate the density. So you basically need to learn a model here and using that model to estimate the traffic state in order to be able to apply that type of a control I described. So I will next illustrate what is now the different blocks in, in here. Um, and of course, I'm more than happy if you, you have some questions and, 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 and so on here. So first of all, let's go a little bit more into detail here about the sensing part. So the green part in the plot, how does it work? So we now assume that each vehicle, the, each red vehicle, it acts as a sensor and that it's able now to sense around it. So it can sense its own um, state, its own position, its own uh, velocity. And, and that information is, is that available. And then what we do is that we out of this information, we then estimate around this vehicle, we estimate the, the, the traffic density, the velocity of the traffic and the flow of the traffic close to each of these sensor vehicles. This can be done in, with different type of methods. To the right here, you see basically the, the bar here, the gray lines are indicating a vehicle. And you see there is high density here to the right of the vehicles. Now we could discretize the road in time and space and represent now the density and estimate the density. And that is the, the yellow, uh, sorry, the, the red, um, stepwise function there. 
One can also use in Gaussian kernel and try to estimate this and you get a, a smoother and perhaps a nicer estimate of the traffic density as you see here. So, so that's the later one, the Gaussian kernel method is what we actually are, are doing. So let's go one step further into the, the detail, what, what it looks like. So the green thing here is now a connected vehicle. That connected vehicle get information of what happening around it, maybe from its cameras or other sensors, it gets this type of information. And then simply what it does is that it now just estimate the traffic density from uh, these the, with this uh, Gaussian um, kernels phi here. So we are using that because that gives a nice representation of the of the density. And similarly, then for the traffic speed and flow and the overtaking flow, we can out of the density estimate we can generate them by uh, the equations that you you see down here. Having that information, that was on the sensor side. Now let's jump over to the other side. Let's look at the actuation side. So on the actuation side, we have the tracks, right, in the platoon. So we can regulate the velocity of that or the reference speed, as you see. We can also, we actually have another degree of freedom. We can also think about that we regulate if they should go in two lanes or in one lane in this case, right? If they go in two lanes, it becomes a more severe bottleneck so that we have more authority if you want the actuation actuator is stronger this can now be represent that actuation as i said can be represented in as a variation in the flux function so the ability for for having a certain flow when you have a certain density that is shown there so what we do is that we build a model where the flux function you saw entered into the differential equation is changing depending on what type of control that we have. So what type of control do we have? So the control is exactly the same I showed you previously, right? So we minimize now the total time spent for all the traffic, giving now this dynamics, this dynamical model that I, I showed. So we solve that type of, of problem. To solve that problem, we then need estimates of the state of the system over the, the, the whole, its whole state space. So this, we, we reconstruct the traffic space state now using this model that we have learned from data, but also by propagating a particular simplified model of the traffic state. It's called front tracking. So you basically don't, you don't propagate the full Part your differential equation. Instead, you, you you propagate part of it. You do an abstract version, as you saw in the diagram. So, so these these are putting the things uh, all together. It's just one more more piece there, and that is when you learn the flux function. You don't know the flux function of the road traffic, and that can be done in different way. One can do it uh, parametrically or non-parametric. So, so basically you gather a lot of data. Remember these dots I showed that we had on the fundamental diagram from Stockholm here. These are the gray dots here. So the question is out of these gray dots, how do I learn the diagram which I can plug into my, my, my control law? So, so this is another piece of, of, of this thing. So if we put this control system all together there, we can evaluate that. And again, the evaluation here is similar to what you have seen uh, me speaking about before. So in this case, the yellow again is congested areas. They are a different, coming up a different time. The, uh, we have a lot of tra road traffic. We have a few controlled vehicles. These are the red lines. And you can see here that if we have no control, the congestion is there and it's influenced the traffic. If we have full information control, we, we get a, a nice uh, situation. But also, if we don't have full information, but we built this basically database learning control uh, uh, system that I described, we can get something which is almost as good as with the full information. We cannot know uh, everything. Um, we can evaluate that in, in various ways. We can look at how much is it 
how much does the travel time vary? How much delay in my uh, does it take when I drive a car now from the left to the right here on this road? If you have full information, the delay is, is rather, uh, rather small. You can regulate the system well. If you have no control, the delay is consistently large. And with this reconstruction-based uh, uh, model learning approach, we get something in, in, in the middle there, in between. In my uh, slides here, I had a little bit more going into detail about this, this approach. We have developed something which in the machine learning literature is called physics-based uh, uh, or, or, or physics-informed machine learnings. We have built some um, machine learning techniques in order to estimate the, the, the component of this um, PDE model here. And then we have been using also a neural network to do the, the, the reconstruction. I won't have time to talk about this, but if any one of you working in this area are interesting, I'm more than happy to provide you. You see, this is very recent uh, work that we have been doing. Here you see how well this works, this algorithm, when we can reconstruct the density here based on the information from these red probe vehicles here in the situation where we are going um, towards the traffic light and, and you see it's work uh, pretty well. But I, I will skip this last few slides and come to the conclusion instead. So the first hour or hour and, and 15 minutes or so, I talked about that control architecture for automating road freight transport. As was pointed out here in the question, this was mainly because we want to lower the energy or lower the CO2 footprint of this type of massive transportation happening. But it's also just the operation in general, automate the operation, improve the operation has been the motivation. And I showed a number of control problems and optimization problems that come into this system. And then the later part I talked about that actually such a system can also be used to improve traffic. So we, we constructed a traffic regulation problem and I describe um, this new architecture, which is, we are quite excited about where we're using individual vehicles to do this control. And I, I talk about this physics informed machine learning. I know that the, the, the next speaker, as I said, she's going to, uh, Professor Antonella Ferrara, she's going to talk about more of, of, of some of these things going into the detail of the models and, 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 and so on. What is nice, uh, some of you might be looking for problems to work on or, or, or you want to look into new problems here. I mean, how this control design for the later part here should be done is I would say fairly open. We have some contributions, but it's, it's really in the beginning here. What is nice is that it really has some practical influence as you see with these experiments and so on. So this, this results have the potential to come into use and actually make a change in the, in the world to the, to the better. If there is any questions or so, I mean, all the papers here and material is on my homepage and I'm more than happy if you have questions now or you send me an email or so and I, I, I would be happy to continue our discussion. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm more than happy to take also any questions right now if we have time. Thank, thank you. you. Professor, it was a really interesting topic. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, I mean, that was really interesting idea. And uh, for me, it sounds a little bit like that. So we can use this, uh, let's say, individual element uh, to control the traffic a little bit similar to what we were using before as variable speed limits. But no, we don't have the variable speed limits, but we have the actual car that will kind of control the traffic. Uh, but what I couldn't realize maybe later I need to go and look at your papers to see how it works. But uh, I wonder if you can explain a little bit that how we can actually model this, uh, like the change or the control of the speed of uh, these cars or trucks on uh, like the macroscopic model that we had. So we had some macroscopic model 
that show the dynamics for the density and the speed normally. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now we have this truck that we're controlling their speed. So how the speed of this truck or this uh, vehicles will affect on uh, those uh, microscopic models? That, that's, that's a great question. Let me go uh, back here somewhere. Let me go to this, this slide. Uh, yeah, th thanks for that. that that's uh, a, a great question. So it's basically, uh, yeah, you see, this is something really interesting also just to, to, to um, uh, mention it to the, to the rest of the audience, because basically what we have here and what the question is about is that we have a PDE describing the traffic flow. So that's what what can be called the, 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 the macro model. The, uh, the micro model is actually an ODE. It's a differential equation, which is representing a single vehicle here. So we now is, is so to say, combining an ODE into a PDE. And this is non-trivial how, how that should be done. And, and there have been a, a few proposals in the, in the literature. The way we did it in, in one part here, is that we represent the individual vehicle. We say that the fundamental diagram now, so Q, so Q here, when we are around this point in space and time, Q is shifted from the big Q here to a smaller Q. So we are shrinking the flow basically around that. And when this is shrinking here, it gets an effect right on the on the PDE. So Q is not just so to say some just a static function, which is it might be in the basic setup when we have the flux function there. But it's actually a function which is changing in time. So this one piece of it. Another piece is, as I said, that one could now with such a changing flux function, you can now solve the PDE using the numerical methods that is there and so on. But in the more recent work here, we do an, an abstraction of that. So we try to, to, to propagate the fronts here and reason about what happens when there is this density shift. So this line I'm pointing to here, how does that evolve now through this, this PDE with this change of the flux function. So this is, this is the way that we, uh, uh, that, that we do that. Does it answer the... Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, the, sure. Kimia, yeah, no. Oh, sorry. I, I was okay. thinking yeah. that maybe uh, like we could also modify a little bit uh, what was in the literature before uh, for the modeling of the variable speed limits on uh, the macroscopic model, and uh, then uh, like uh, come up with a new model for that. But okay, so that's a little bit different because here, uh, I mean, the, the interesting thing is that so we have the trucks or the other vehicles that we want to control and then they are really moving with the flow and normally this macroscopic models that we have uh, i mean like the ctm they're the cell based so we have like this description destruction over the space but when we have the trucks that they are moving maybe then we don't need this restrictions over a space anymore so, so I, I can show, this is this is an excellent. Uh, I mean, you're you're the expert here, uh, Kimia. So let me show exactly what you what you described there with the CTM model. So if we translate that into the CTM model, what it happens there, as you see, the relationship between the flow now and the density will now be modified by properties of the um, of the, the trucks and that is here represented yeah. by the v uh, the, 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 the v that you have there and the, and the double and the w so you see that you, you can you can in, and we have done that also you can include this modification that the trucks impose also on the ctm model in a fairly straightforward uh, manner 
So I think, and, and th there is also in the, in the literature, also more mathematicians have been working on, uh, you know, what is the consequence on the solution of, because as you can imagine, the PD now, either the first order like I talked about here or the second order PD, they can become quite tricky if you now start uh, this type of, um, of, of mixture of models and, yeah. and, and so. Our approach here have not only been to represent it physically well, but also how can we come up with control methods? How can we use this for control? That's why we are playing around with a few different methods for, for, doing, for doing this. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Thank you, thanks. So uh, I would like to ask if uh, someone has a question so we can discuss it now here. Maybe you can... Actually, I have a question. Uh, it, uh, if I understand correctly, you use the kernel uh, density estimation to estimate the density of the flow. Uh, but at the same time, you more or less have a model of the dynamical system. Is it? Yes. Why don't you combine these two information together like in, in common filter, you use the dynamics to uh, optimize the a posterior distribution. But in this case, it seems that you just take the measurement and use the measurement to smooth out the density without considering the dynamics. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's another great question. Maybe, maybe I put up the slide also here so everyone can follow what you, you, uh, what you ask about. I think it's, it's a very valid uh, question. Uh, so you see here when we talk. Uh, so when we talk about what is known and what is not known here, I mean. So basically, if I if I reiterate the question, it's a little bit like, okay, why don't we do the usual thing? We have a model of the system we want to control, and we just so to say estimate that model, and then we plug that into a an observer, a Kalman filter, where we use to regenerate the traffic state. And I mean, we are somehow doing that. Why it doesn't look like the usual thing with the Kalman filter here is due to basically the model you see down to the right here. So our system where you know, the, the PDE here, it's, what we do is basically that we don't, uh, we, are, we are not generating a filter based on the full PDE. It's very hard out of data, individual particle information from a PDE and to estimate the state of the PDE. It's, it doesn't work exactly like it do, for instance, for ODE, where we have much more theory and, and knowledge of that. Instead, what we do is that we, use the structure of this model. So you saw that the Q here, we come back to that now and then, and Kimia asked me these questions uh, about the Q function, right? That have certain structure. And we try to learn some of that structure. And then when we have that structure, we can use that to reconstruct the state based on measurement that we have. But also there, when we represent, when we reconstruct the state, notice again that I don't reconstruct the state out of the PDE directly, because this is not so easy to do actually. So instead, I, I do this thing that I basically also approximate the PDE using this this uh, model that I, I uh, introduce. So that so the reason is basically, if I say it very simple, that. There is not a complete theory about how to control this type of, of PDEs uh, in, in a sense for this type of system that I, I have here with this mix of, uh, of ODE and, and PDE. And I do like I do here because it seems like it's one natural thing to do and bring it, uh, so to say, tying it up to these, these pieces that I then describe in the, in, so to say, in the coming, coming slide. And here it was for the traffic state estimation. But let me at the same time, when I say that, let me also emphasize that this is one proposal. Okay. 
So this is one. I'm, I'm not saying that this is, so it's not like when we teach uh, uh, Kalman filtering and L2G uh, in our class and we say, this is a beautiful theory. This is the way one should do <laughs> linear systems or something like that. Here, it's a bit more complicated. It's a new type of system. It's a new type of physical system that we would like to control. It's not in the literature that there is a textbook on how to do these controls. We are really on somehow on the, the border of what system theory can tell us and what the practical implementation and how the constraints there could, could be. So I very much encourage if, if some of you are interested to look into, also if you're working in machine learning and these Gaussian kernels and so on, I mean, there could be other ways here that could be very natural to, to do. There is also this interesting area that I only uh, started to study the last, the last couple of years now of physics inspired machine learning. I mentioned that in the, in the end there, where it's similar. I mean, we, we are probably the first one doing it for this type of systems, but you know, the, the basic idea in that area of, of physics and machine learning is to say that many physical processes are such that cert, it's hard to learn them with just a deep neural network, just by a black box, right? But you have certain structure that you can learn. You know that it's Newton mechanics or you knew certain things, and then you encode that aside information into your learning algorithm. So if you look, view uh, what I talk about here, you can see that it's a little bit a similar spirit. We have a certain structure of this, of this uh, uh, PD, as Kimia was, was also talking about, and we are exploring that structure in order to be able to, 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 to develop now uh, data-based or machine learning techniques uh, here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, Professor. Ah, hey, Sheena, good to see you. Sorry. See, thanks. Um, I was wondering uh, if uh, there is any delay, if the delay in the communication or in the measurements uh, is considerable so that uh, we consider it in uh, modeling our system or in the control. So are you talking about now for the platooning or you're talking about this uh, for later? Both. For Sorry? Both. For both. Yeah. Uh, so... So in this, in the, in the later part, no, we didn't consider delay uh, much here because, you know, the, it's traffic that we are regulating. So the time constant, of course, things can happen in traffic very quickly, but basically what we are describing here at this point, it's not a limitation in the, in the communication. If you're not talking about doing extremely large computations and so on with this, these models, but here, uh, delay have, hasn't been a hasn't been a point. Uh, in the earlier the, in the earlier part, in uh, the, what about the sensor delays in the in the second part? The sensor. You, uh, oh, now I get it. Okay, so if if you now um, I see, so you're thinking like this: we have a vehicle now which is supposed to estimate its its uh, state around by maybe using video streams and so on, how would the delay in, in, in processing that affect the control system? Uh, that's a fantastic uh, proposal. No, we, we, didn't, uh, we didn't work on that, but I think that's very relevant because you can imagine that this could be quite costly for uh, to do that uh, processing. And if you now, you know, if, if this now takes a few seconds or something like that, that delay could affect actually your ability here. And you could think about that you would like to compensate for that type of delay. And that's a very, very good point, but it's, uh, and, and uh, that, that would be something interesting to investigate. Um, uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for that. I can also maybe comment on the early part. So when we talk about the control of an individual platoon, <laughs> then one have to be careful with, with delays, right? Because if the vehicle ahead is, is braking or slowing down, we need to, to uh, you know, do that instantaneously. And, uh, you know, so there one have to take into, typically not the communication delay because communication is, is fast, but there could be other delays in the system. 
like computation delays or activation delays and, 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 and so that comes into play. So one have to be, be careful with the experiments we have been doing, as you saw, the delays there haven't really been an issue uh, so that one, we, we haven't used any delay compensation techniques or so, but one have to be aware of it so that uh, one do not, so to say, inject any delays in the, in the closed loop. And in the first part, uh, you assume that uh, every vehicle uh, uses the information of the vehicle ahead, and uh, uh, only one vehicle ahead. Uh, but uh, if in its dynamics, it's, uh, it uses uh, the information or the, st the states of the uh, a multiple, a number of vehicles ahead, uh, can it uh, help it uh, to improve the uh, performance? Absolutely. Absolutely, that's a good point. Good comment. So, in the particular result I described here, we we, we uh, had that type of uh, string uh, or, or line graph. Uh, but we we have the question or the problem you describe. We we have also investigated that. So, how does the configuration, the topology of the communication, how does that how does that influence the the uh, control? performance, basically. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, uh, Muhammad Pirani, uh, we worked quite a bit on that, how, how the robustness of the system is influenced by the topology. Um, so it's interesting to say exactly what you pointed out. What if every vehicle are in contact with two other vehicles or with three other vehicles and, and so on? How does that, that influence? So this is, it's very interesting to, to try to understand that. A challenge from an implementation viewpoint is that, you know, in many cases now with vehicle to vehicle communication, you can communicate maybe 100 meters or 200 meters. A track can be 100 meters long. Mm -hmm. So it's not so easy to guarantee that you can have connectivity to two tracks or three tracks all the time. So you will typically lose or you get this and so on. So how should you take into account a more intermittent type of communication network uh, mm -hmm. in here and combine that with the control you are doing. And that is, of course, a, a, a bit of a challenge because maybe when you really need communication in a difficult situation is maybe also when it's more likely that you are not well connected with, with all the other vehicles. So, mm -hmm. but it's a very interesting problem of how, how one should be, be doing, uh, doing that. Thanks. In that case, can we can we consider delay in communication because we have uh, higher lengths between? Yeah, but that that depends again on how you model the communication between the vehicles. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you know, you can think in in that there is kind of a one hop. So when I talk about to say who communicates with whom, yeah, I'm thinking one hop. Mm -hmm. Why? Because if you have multiple hops, that typically take time to, to do multiple hop. And then the question is, is it better to wait for this and have a lot of, of, of communication, so to say, propagating in the network or, 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 or so? If it's one hop and you communicate 100 meters or 200 meters, it doesn't really matter. That delay in, because of the range of the communication is not what what, what uh, adds to the delay, right? It's really the processing of the information and the interfaces, which would not, uh, would not increase. But, but I think if, if you want an interesting problem is to think about this varying topology, varying network, should you now impose a certain variation in that network? And how should you handle that versus that the network itself changes because of environmental conditions. And this to a large extent is an open problem, how to combine that network model with the control of, uh, of the platoon, the control system. Sure, thanks. And uh, uh, sorry for my <laughs> series of questions. Uh, for the second part of your talk, uh, what is the time step for computing and applying the control signal to the autonomous vehicles? Oh, now you ask me a, a, a good question. I actually, in the implementation here, I don't, I, I don't, 
know what is the so you, you're thinking about so to say the update rate when we implement uh, this i mean because the formulation here is continuous time right and it's a centralized controller right it's a centralized controller as, as it is, yes, yes. I don't know in the implementation, but in a sense, you can say that, you know, it's, it's it, it, you know, here it's in the second part, it's not implementation of real vehicles yet. So it's not, I, I don't have any, any figures here. So it's more, you know, you basically implement this continuous time control law. So okay. I, I I, I don't know really what in the discretization here of this, what, what so I think that you partition the highway into uh, several cells of, for example, 100 kilometers. And for, for each part, you uh, design a control, a centralized oh. control. Or... Oh, you mean how this should be, how this should be split up, you, 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 you're saying. Yes, yeah, so, so let me, maybe I can, I can share my, my screen again. So, so. What I wanted to point out here is that the formulation I talked about here in the end, this is like a continuous time and, and such so a continuous space formulation. So here, nothing is discretized. It's like the, the, you, you consider the whole. In the earlier part, I mentioned this discretized model. And then you typically discretize it maybe with a cell size of uh, a few hundred meters or something like that. In this case, it's the, the whole road. Now you would ask, uh, uh, wonder, uh, like you do, Shima, that, okay, if this is now a road which is uh, 100 kilometer, 1,000 kilometer, is it still one controller? Is this one system or would you split it up? And uh, I, I, I don't really have any intelligent uh, answer to that more than I, I would assume that one would. You would like to keep it under one hood as long as one piece of congestion can influence another piece, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that because you would like to have the authority to maybe, you know, do some control around Lausanne if it's now influenced something in Montreux. But maybe it's not reasonable to say that Lausanne need to be connected to Zurich because Zurich is so far away. Mm -hmm. So, um, but in our studies here so far, we, we, we just started to think about how to chop this up into some clusters or some larger segments. My expectation would be that one would consider something like, let's say, 100 kilometers or, or, or so. And then one would have to think about what is the exchange in between this, this system. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But it's not really any limitation. I mean, look at the technology. I mean, it's not any limitation to communicate now a lot of information. You know, you should think about the arrows here. It's like 5G communication. We, we have, so to say, enormous bandwidth and we have a lot of resources available and so on. So it's not like we have a limitation of sending a few bits or only communicating locally and so on. So we, we are thinking in that, in that sense, right? A, a quite a massive uh, control system. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, thank you. Thanks. I have a question uh, uh, sort of following up on this present discussion. So uh, uh, related to the communication, so if, if a certain uh, vehicle is able to, uh, uh, let's say, acquire measurements from more than uh, one vehicles uh, ahead of it, then uh, would it uh, be more valuable in terms of the performance of uh, the control? Uh, yes, it, it would. And, and let, me, let me jump to that just with some to illustrate a little bit what you are. Uh, let's see if I have some. Maybe I don't have a good. Um, uh, 
Yeah, I, I, I just put up a f the full figure. I, I don't have the result I, I'm going to talk about, but I, I, I will tell you what, what we know. So what you basically are, are asking is that if we have a, if we have a situation like this, when I talk about some, some of the control algorithm here, the first vehicle was communicating to the second, the second to the third, and so on. And basically the question is what happens if we now say that the first vehicle is communicating both to the second and the third? How do we measure the, the improvement of performance? And you can do that in different ways. So one way is to just formulate it overall as a control problem where you would like now to, um, you know, you would like to stabilize the error in between the vehicle. If you have now more communication, if you write out up that as a control system, right, you basically have more possibility to move the, the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the the modes, the state of the of the system, right? So that you have faster convergence if you like to do a stability analysis. So I mean, one, one can just do that type of study and show that the more in the more communication you have, the better. And so, so it's not. I mean, it's a network control system or a multi-agent system with more connectivity that can only be better in more connectivity. But when I say that, you see. Uh, that relates a little bit to the previous discussion that it's maybe not such a stationary scenario that is so interesting in practice here. And it's a little bit trivial to say that everyone should just communicate more because then you have a better system. So instead, what we have been looking into is, for instance, robustness measures. So you would like now to measure how robust is your, your system here now. And one can use uh, some uh, graph uh, theoretic multi-agent type of system. I was mentioning this name Pirani who was a postdoc in my, my group and working on this robust multi-agent systems. And then instead one can get some sort of a, of a trade-off if one put costs on the communication. So one can see that maybe one should have a communication between vehicle, you know, this vehicle should have communication from the vehicle in front and behind. And such a topology would be much better than just communication from the vehicle in front. So, so one can sort of say reason about that type of additional communication versus if you can improve the robustness of the system, which you can measure with the usual sense of some uncertainty and, 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 and so on. So, so this, this is a possibility to, uh, to analyze various types of, of communication. Let me also throw in a different set of, of work here, which is also interesting. So now in this thing, we, we talk about who is communicating with whom. Another way to think about this is to say that when should a vehicle communicate its state information to other vehicles? So another line of work that we developed for this is on event-based control. Then you can say the following, the first vehicle communicates to the second vehicle, second to the third and so on, most of the time. If something, if there is a drastic change in the state of the second vehicle, then an event is triggered and then that vehicle in addition communicates its information to a few more vehicles. So you can form that type of event-based communication strategy and improve now control under uh, certain transient or, or, or failure or disturbance type of, uh, of scenarios. So this is another way of thinking about why not just communicating to, to another vehicle along the, the stream here in stationarity, but actually changing the communication uh, topology depending on what is happening in the in the system. So the later part there is event based con control. Okay, okay, thank you. So I just have one following uh, follow up question. So uh, in your uh, the the slide that you showed where you have a series of uh, trucks. So is it 
is it possible to come up with a formulation of the of the flow where uh, if you consider any truck then it contains uh, basically all the information of all the uh, i mean trucks ahead of it like a markov process so whatever it communicates to the previous truck behind it it basically encodes all the information ahead of it uh, absolutely i mean this this is this is an, a, an idea you can think about a little bit like one can do a control here completely distributed. And I indicated in the beginning that that could have some limitations doing that. We can then do something completely centralized. And we have talked about some limitations of doing it completely centralized. Uh, now, an interesting idea that you say is that what about that each truck have some model about the other trucks that it keep updating as we are driving along here. And that update model could be a Markov model as you suggest or some other model. And this is, yes, absolutely, this, this can be done. And uh, that is an interesting, an interesting idea. One could perhaps think about that one vehicle, what is useful is to understand if the vehicle ahead is changing if that is about to do some change, just like I show that if the road is the, the road topography is changing, in that case, we actually use that information and feed forward that into our control system. If we can now predict and say that the vehicle ahead is probably changing its velocity into the near future here, then we could use that as well to improve the control. And that could be done by having some internal model in the, the truck. I think that sounds like a, a, a good idea or an interesting idea. Okay, okay. thank you. Thanks. So is there any other question? Okay, so if there is not, uh, I would like to thank you again, Carl, for your intriguing talk. That was really nice to have you here.